There's always just something so pleasing to the soul when I see Luffy go in and just, you know, smack or punch someone in the face when they're truly just being an awful, heinous individual. Just seeing that final part of this chapter pleased me greatly. Now, I do want to point out something which I think might be a little bit obvious, but even then, though, I still want to point it out regardless. If anyone noticed, Luffy used Red Hawk against Hold'em. Now, at first glance, Red Hawk, we've seen it many times before. However, there is a really good important little detail that we gotta remember from Red Hawk, and the reason why it's so important why Luffy used it against Hold'em in that moment. Remember Tama. Tama, she had a promise with Ace in the past. She, you know, didn't want to believe that Ace was dead, and she just didn't want to believe what Luffy was saying, but on top of that, you know, she was just promised that maybe one day she would get to join the dude's crew, Ace's crew, and... Seeing that move from Luffy using Red Hawk against Hold'em, I feel like it's going to open up Tama's eyes that Luffy wasn't really lying about Ace, what happened to Ace, and she's probably going to start to accept it, realize that Ace is probably gone. I feel like what, that's what that final moment of the chapter really signifies, is that Luffy using Red Hawk is kind of like saying, look, you know, I will protect you now. Ace is no longer here to protect you. I will protect you to make sure you're okay. I think that was just a solid moment, solid little setup from Oda, and allowing Tama as a character to progress and realize and accept Ace's death. So anyways, let's talk about uh, Tama's situation, and kind of how sad it is, and how it ties in with the beginning portion of this chapter, and also what we saw from Momo a long time ago in Drez Rosa. So at the beginning of the chapter, you see this child that's crying, and you have this woman's like, you don't need to cry, you're a, you know, a child of Wano, you're someone that is like a man of Wano, you shouldn't be crying, keep your feelings to yourself. We've seen this type of theme from other individuals from Wano, for instance, Momo or Kondro, we have seen it to where they will not allow themselves to express their feelings. And so in this moment, when you see how the, the mother or whatever, or the woman's like, don't cry or whatever, it implies how Tama is feeling as well. Tama is not allowed to cry. She's not allowed to be upset. She's not allowed to say I'm falling or be worried about herself. She has to remain very strong. And so in that moment at the end of the chapter, when she's like, Luffy, you already saved me. Don't worry and all that. And you know, just see how she's falling and all that. She's legit falling. She's not worried about herself. She's just like, you already saved me. Don't worry. It's showcasing one of the big themes going on in Wano. And that's how our characters are not allowed to properly express themselves, not allowed to really show when they're sad, upset, or whatever, their weaknesses, they have to always remain strong and just lie and put on this mask. And I think that's kind of what was being shown there in this chapter with the beginning towards the end of the chapter as well. But also, I do want to point out that the situation with Tama, I think, is very similar to what happened to Luffy in the past. If you remember back when, you know, Sabo and Ace, you know, they were with Luffy and they were all children, remember, Luffy got in a situation where he was captured, Sabo and Ace came in and saved him. And I feel like, in a way, Tama being captured by Hold'em and seeing how she was hurt and all that, I feel like Luffy was remembering the time when he was captured and what happened to Ace and Sabo. I feel like that's kind of a correlation going on here as well is that you know Luffy's looking at Tama like a little sister wanting to protect her making sure like no harm comes to her at all and he got really angry and that's why he attacked Hold'em in the first place so yeah I, I just feel like there's a lot of parallels going on here in this chapter that Oda was you know setting up with what happened with Ace and Luffy in the past and Sabo and correlating with Tama. I want to talk about how Law's design or his uh his disguise is impressive it's <laughs> you you can definitely see the straw hats have rubbed rubbed off on law quite a bit because if you would go back to let's say the beginning of punk hazard or whatever when we got to see law once again law never never would have disguised himself like that there's just no way the man would put literally like a basket on his head to disguise himself like that's that's not law that, that really isn't law what he would do in the past he was all stubborn stuck up or whatever and now seeing how he puts this like basket on his head to just disguise his identity i'm like oh my god you could just you you could see the man has picked up personality traits from the straw hats and i truly love it speaking of which i'm really glad to see law back once again because he's always been one of my favorite characters in One Piece, but also he's pretty much like my favorite Supernova, so I'm glad to see Law once again taking the front lines, being kind of important, and he's probably even going to go up against Hawkins in the upcoming chapter, and if that really does happen, 
I did not realize how much I actually wanted that. I'm really curious to see what's going to happen. Because, I mean, Hawkins, he technically has a life pool. He can't really die. And Law, his, his Della Fruits, uh... It's broken. <laughs> we, we know how broken his Della Fruit really can be, especially when it comes to the immortality, you know, operation that he can do, which, you know, Doffy wanted from Law in the first place. But just seeing Law once again and seeing how he's probably going to be going up against Hawkins, I'm looking forward to that. Now, the question is, will Hawkins actually fight Law? That is a big question I have because Hawkins is a big wild card in this chapter. We can clearly see him that he follows his, you know, cards to the letter. He will never go against his cards. So if his cards tell him to join Luffy, I feel like he's going to probably join Luffy. He's that type of individual. And I feel like the reason why he's trying to warn Holm and everybody around and get in contact with him is because he realizes that if you try to mess with Luffy, it's not going to be that easy. You're just going to get demolished like it's nothing. And I believe before everything is said and done, Hawkins is probably going to join over to Luffy's side, potentially becoming an ally, just because of, you know, how he follows the cards. He's going to realize that Luffy you know, has a chance of beating Kaido, and he's like, you know what, I gotta follow this man. That's probably why he started, you know, siding with Kaido in the first place, because he realized if he didn't, he was gonna die, and the cards pretty much told him to, or he would die. And that's probably why Kid's by himself just getting, you know, all beat up in a cell and by himself. Let's talk about, uh, the situation with Zoro and Luffy for a second, and how amazing it is to just see how much trust they have in each other. We've always known that Luffy and Zoro, they've had this bond. You know, it's captain and vice captain. They've always had faith in each other. And if we go back a long time ago, back to, I think, either Fishman Island or Punk Hazard, I forget the exact, you know, arc it was stated. But, you know, Zoro said if Luffy wasn't able to do so-and-so this much, then he really couldn't be our captain. We would need to find a replacement. And I just like this. I like seeing how much faith Zoro has in Luffy and how much Luffy has faith in Zoro. Because if you really think about it, Luffy told Zoro to do something very critical to Luffy's character. Food. Think about this. Luffy. Food. That's, uh, that's always been a big thing to the man. He always wants to fight for food, protect food, whatever. And him telling Zoro, like, hey, go, go get that food and all that. You deal with this. I'll deal with this guy over here. It's like Luffy's giving Zoro one of the most important jobs there is to, uh, you know, go grab the food and make sure everything is okay for he could probably have a feast. That's a... That's a funny moment to think about, is that Luffy actually had Zoro do a very important job, but he has faith in Zoro that he would get the job done, and Zoro's like, okay, he doesn't even care that Luffy just speed blitzed the hell out of Hold'em like it was nothing, and got Tama out of his clutches. That was honestly impressive as well. I mean, we know that Luffy has increased as an individual, like, in terms of stamina, endurance. It's always been one of his big things since the beginning, is Luffy's had high endurance. And with the whole match against Katakuri, we know that Luffy's upgraded considerably. He's gotten a lot of endurance, and he's also been able to get observation hockey, a higher tier of observation hockey. So I feel like, you know, seeing what he did in this chapter, speed blitzing hold him like that, it just really shows how much he has developed as a character, as a fighter, and as a captain in general, and I feel like any normal fighter is really not going to do much to Luffy anymore. I mean, the only people that probably can give him an actual challenge would be fighters on the level of Kata Curry or someone like Jack, which was built up in this chapter, by the way, which I'll get into in just a second. But the big point here I want to state is that I love just the faith in each other. For instance, how, you know, Luffy believes in Zoro, Zoro believes in him, and how they didn't even bat an eye to anything that happened. Even though Zoro hasn't seen Luffy in a while, he realizes that Luffy's always progressing, always getting stronger, and he just moves on like it's nothing, and just goes and tries to do what Luffy tells him to do. Just a great moment overall. Now, talking about Jack. Jack has been introduced for a while, and when we think about it, Jack has been introduced before Katakuri was, and Katakuri, we know how savage that man was, okay, let's not deny how savage Katakuri was, easily one of my favorite characters of all time of One Piece, but also one of my favorite fights with Luffy, I, I honestly, that was just a, a hallmarker for One Piece as a series with how good that was, I cannot wait to finally see that animated in the anime, but getting off of that though, all the Katakuri, you know, fanboying, we know how strong Katakuri was, how OP he was, and Jack is kind of like the equivalent of that. He's a calamity. He is someone that is Kaido's right-hand man. Now, we don't really know if Jack is literally the strongest 
of Kaido's forces, there might be someone higher than him, we don't really know, that is up to Oda to really decide that, but Jack, as we know, is incredibly powerful, and so we don't know if the situation with Jack is going to be the equivalent of, let's say, Cracker versus Luffy, or, you know, Katakuri versus Luffy, we don't really know where Jack actually stands amongst, you know, Kaido's forces, however, Jack is not going to be easy by any means, he's definitely going to be a very rough fight, and out of all the fighters we've seen so far in this arc, I think Jack is probably going to be the hardest fight for Luffy besides Kaido himself or some others of Big Mom's forces. And I feel like Jack is probably going to pop up very soon. And we're probably going to get to see how much Luffy has progressed as a fighter. Because remember, Katakuri, he was insane. He was a savage, okay? And if we remember, Jack, the only reason why his bounty is so ridiculous is because it was inflated by constantly just, you know, being violent towards random people throughout the world. So, Jack's bounty, even though it's over 1 billion, doesn't mean technically he is that strong, like Katakuri was. Katakuri, you know, kind of kept to himself. He didn't really do the, as much as Jack did. So, for all we know, Jack might not really be much compared to Katakuri. However... Even if he might not be as strong as Katakuri, at the very least, he is a very durable individual. Because we gotta look at the facts, the cold, hard facts and feats from Jack himself. He was a man that got hit by a giant moving elephant. You don't just get up after that, okay? I mean, I could see someone like Whitebeard, the Admirals, you know, even a Yonko getting up after getting smacked by Zoe, you know, getting smacked by a giant elephant. But Jack got back up after that, which speaks so much about his endurance. On top of that, he went into the ocean. He sunk to the bottom of the ocean, which it's been established that he might be a fishman. It's never been confirmed, but he could be a fishman, and it confirms that maybe fishmen that do have a devil fruit, even though they sink, they won't actually die. So, we don't really know, but Jack has high-level endurance. He has someone that's very strong for what we've seen. He is also a swordsman, the way he turns like his tusk into like swords or whatever. So, we do know that the man is strong. He is not a pushover. However, we do have to remember the fact that when he did go up against Inu and Neko, he was kind of like a coward. He did use, like, smoke and stuff from Caesar and gas to be able to take them out. So, technically, we know he's strong, but at the same time, he is someone that will play dirty, do some really dirty tactics to win. So, we don't really know. We don't really know how strong he is. We just know he has high-level endurance. And so, if we're going along with Luffy and what he's been through, Jack might not be that much. However, he's going to probably be a tank. It's probably going to take a lot to bring the man down. Even if he's not as strong as Kata Curry was, he's probably going to be a freaking tank. He's probably going to take just so much damage that's just going to be like, holy crap. Like, you might just run out of energy before you finally bring the man down. Because like I said, once again, to reiterate, you do not take a hit by a giant elephant and get back up. That just doesn't happen, okay? So, yeah. Anyways, let's um, talk about Hold'em. So, Hold'em... He actually could shoot fire from his lion's stomach, which fascinating. I mean, I think we pretty much have seen the end of Hold'em because he got punched in the face by Luffy, so he's probably done. GG, it's over. But it's cool seeing his moveset, which does kind of let us know that these uh these fake smile users, these fake devil fruits, are actually in some ways very strong or a lot different from what we see from normal zone type users because he legit used fire out of the lion's mouth, which is not like what you would see from a normal zone. Like, if it was a mythical zone or something, like a phoenix, you know, I could see something like that. But it was just a lion, from all we know. So, yeah, him being able to use fire like that is definitely something that is probably unique to smile users, or maybe the dude's devil fruit. But, yeah, these, uh, these smile users are definitely a little bit odd, different. Definitely, you know, fakes compared to Devil Fruits. They definitely have some odd abilities. Which moves into another smile user. We move into Speed, Captain Speed. This face terrifies me on a whole new level. That, that face was truly freaking terrifying. <laughs> like, I gotta admit, I love how unique her design is, okay? Not gonna lie, I like it. However, that face scared me, but also she is not best horse, by the way, or centaur, because Frankie's centaur is way better than hers will ever be. Just stating facts, they're cold, hard 
facts that Frankie Centaur mode will always be better than whatever Speed can do. So, Speed's character, I feel like she's probably going to be relatively important because there is definitely some form of setup for that. Because Oda would just introduce a character like her if she's probably going to be important or not. Like, I feel like even though she might not be the strength level as like someone that can really stand up to someone in Luffy's crew, I feel like she's going to be vital for certain information for our characters to gain where they could probably eventually take down Kaido. Which also is something I do want to mention. There was, once again, more information revealed on this dude called, like, Shuten or whatever. Forgive me if I'm, you know, mispronouncing his name. Which, I'm going to assume that the dude that's being mentioned by Hold'em is actually the dude that was taking in Tom for instance, to do with the Tengu mask, I'm assuming that dude's shooting, you know that, that's actually, you know, uh, the one that Holden is, you know, mentioning, which would explain why the man didn't want to go into town in the first place, because he knew he was a wanted criminal. That's my, you know, point of view on the subject. But I think that's about it, so let me know your thoughts in the comments below how you felt about this chapter. Did you enjoy it? Did you hate it? Please be honest in the comments below. If you enjoy my content, please subscribe. If you like this video, please leave a like. And if you want to get notified for whenever I upload a video, please click the bell icon down below. And with that, Chibi out.